The moment is now, the future is now. Doug, where are you? I'm, uh, I'm in my house uh, in Venice Beach right now. And how have you been faring with the year, with the pandemic in Los Angeles? Because I've visited on Zoom, like the last studio visit I did in this format was in South Africa with William Kentridge. Uh -huh. South Africa fared really well, then had a bit of a summer surge. And of course, now it's in lockdown again. In California, it feels like we're not getting out of safer at home. And it feels like the museum is closed 11 months today. Today is the day that it's 11 months. March 13th, we closed. What, how, have you, how have you dealt with, uh, with the last nearly a year? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a very kind of you know, personal uh, uh, antidote for myself was really, you know, I think in March, April, when everything was shutting down, um, you know, it was, it was drastic. And I think there was a lot of um, uh, confusion and chaos in the air for everybody. And, um, you know, that was a period of time where you didn't know if you could, you know, touch a door handle, um, you know, who you could communicate with. And um, so I think after kind of going through that period, I found myself kind of having this, this um, you know, uh, moment of questioning. And you know, I said, I said, well, you know, what does one do? You know, I, I make things and, um, you know, I was, you know, looking at the museums that were, you know, in such a horrible situation, closing down um, the galleries, uh, you know, everything, you know, and, and it was this kind of moment where I questioned myself. I said, well, am I supposed to do this too? Am I supposed to, um, you know, close down our studio? Am I supposed to uh, stop making work? And um, I, um, I thought about it. I thought, I thought, you know, really this period of time is, is the time you should be making work. You know, you should be making things, you should be creating. And I kind of, um, I kind of went into this mind space where I thought, you know, this is actually a period of time that we should be developing ideas that are uh, like um, absolutely new, that are um, unrealized, um, not making things that we know how to make, but trying to challenge ourselves to, uh, write the future, to push ourselves, to try to, um, you know, really um, take creativity in, into new directions. So I kind of, um, you know, became reclusive for a little while. <laughs> and I would just go to the studio every day for, you know, long periods of time and just develop these, these ideas, these projects, these visions that, um, that I was fascinated by. And eventually they you know, some of them were simply proposals, um, you know, to, to create things under the ocean or in the air or, um, you know, communities. Other things were more tangible artworks. And eventually these kind of gave way and they started, um, they started becoming real, some of them. And it was, um, it was very interesting because, you know, it was a, a moment, I think, of, of, of serious reflection and questioning for all of us. And I think that, you know, what had happened perhaps is, society was moving so fast. There was so much, there was so much information and um, motion, you could say, that for all of us, suddenly we're still. And I think it's a little bit of a situation where you say, you know, is the glass half full, is it half empty? And, you know, maybe you have to look at what we can glean from this, how we can grow and how we can uh, learn more about ourselves. So I, I, I found it to be, you know, it's, it's been a, trying and challenging year, but it's also, um, I've tried to really use uh, creativity as a tool to um, connect with people, to connect with my environment, to connect with myself, so. <laughs> yeah, it's a time, it's a humbling time, and it's a time where you are grateful for the basics in life and life. And it's also a time in a way where, for example, starting to work, I really miss doing studio visits. So doing the studio visits fast became a way how to stay close to artists, how to have a dialogue. And it strangely became even a way to become more international. Like it's space seems to be irrelevant. We, of course, we are not going anywhere and time seems to not pass. It's like ground talk day every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. When did you start, did you always have your studio? Did everybody come to the studio over the time or was it more of a gradual, first you alone and then working, continuing with the studio work? 
Yeah, it, it, it kind of became, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a few less people, but um, our, our studio is like very, um, it's very unorthodox. It's, it's really kind of a number of little buildings with different rooms and kind of as you go through the space, um, each room is almost a different medium. It's almost like you walk into one and there's music and sound that we're working on. Another one is architecture. Another one is, you know, installations or, or just developing, developing things. So the studio is kind of self-quarantined actually. So what happened was it wasn't too much of a stretch for us to just say, you know, I'll, I'll be in this room and you're in that space and you're in this space. And, and you know, and, and it also, it, it became like very, um, you know, I think we became very um, uh, intimate and it became a very strong bond and friendship through the studio, like more so than ever, you know, because we're all kind of in this together. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful to hear. So perhaps we go to the first slide and we keep, keep that slide. Normally I ask every artist, do you have a work that you did as a child or as a teenager that looking back looks like a, a mature work of yourself? And you were hesitant about this, but I thought I should still ask you about it. Is that something, is that when did you, when did you think you possibly might want to become an artist. Did you know as a child you would, you will? I, you know, I, I just was always, always, always making things. I, I never had a starting point. I never, I never, you know, said, I didn't, I, I think I was making art before I knew what the word art was. Um, you know, I grew up uh, as an only, only uh, child and um, I had a lot of time on my hands and I would just take everything and anything that was around me and try to transform it. Um, you know, it's a newspaper, you rip it up and you make a collage. There's a sheet of uh, blank paper in the trash can, so you draw on it. And so I was kind of always doing this and it just kind of gradually became wider and wider into different mediums. Um, and I think it was really kind of fueled by curiosity. You know, I, 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 saw that, I saw that by creating, it was a way to explore, to, to journey into new worlds or to author places that didn't exist. Was it your parents' encouragement and inspiration or did you have a great art teacher or, or was it just you, you just did it? Um, I was always just doing it, but I was, um, I was very fortunate when I was young to be, um, I, I, my, my, my mother and father were um, kind of incessantly traveling. And when I say that, I don't mean um, like five, five star travel. I mean, um, okay, we're gonna go to the Amazon jungle now for three weeks and we're gonna bring a tent. Uh, we're going to um, go to you know, Russia in the early 80s or Central Africa. So they had this kind of, um, this kind of very um, intense curiosity about the world, about you know, the world, about culture, about kind of how different societies work. So you know, I was just kind of there. I was just kind of um, you know, tagging along, but also absorbing this. And I think that, that had a tremendous um, uh, impact on me when I look back on it, because I think it, it, it kind of, it dissolved the boundaries between people. You kind of just recognize at a young age that everybody's in this together. Everyone's kind of, um, there's this commonality. And I think that's a, a very important aspect of art making also. The moving, 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 the curiosity, the restlessness is definitely several threads that go through all of your work of, of nearly 30 years now. You very early on, you were like 19, 18, 19 when you went to Art Center and you first studied magazine illustration before fine art. Was that something that fascinated you, magazines or? It was, um, it was, an, <laughs> it was an accident, actually. Um, <laughs> I was going to a public school and um, uh, I had a you know, really wonderful um, art teacher there, uh, a Japanese American woman who was actually in the concentration camp in Manzanar. And, um, and she was, um, you know, just very, um, very, um, very focused. And, and she said one day, she said, you got to go this weekend to some, uh, some college, local college around Los Angeles had some a portfolio day where different art schools show up. And, you know, I didn't even think about this. I was super young and um, I showed up to one of them. I waited in line and um, this man in the front of the line who was, was looking at portfolios and stuff and flipping through chain smoking cigarettes, John Lennon glasses. Um, I was totally intimidated and he starts looking at my work and he says, um, you know, you absolutely have to come to the school and we'll, um, we'll help you out. We'll get you in and all that. And um, this guy was actually, um, I had no idea at the time, of course, but um, he was actually like one of uh, Andy Warhol's close friends. He was a 
an iconic illustrator who had done um, many of the Blue Note jazz album covers of the 50s and 60s. And um, just a real, became like a real kind of a muse to me later on. But um, so I think, but I think that's kind of how life works also. Life is like this kind of really like unpredictable chain of events, a sequence that's just kind of moving on its own sometimes. And um, so I think that for me, it was just kind of one of those, one of those um, random encounters that, you know, help, help shape shift. <laughs> yeah. So teenager goes to art center, doesn't know how well renowned and world famous art center in Pasadena is, and you get admitted as a teenager. You you uh, you end your studies in '91 in fine arts. So you we got you in the art world. We're all very grateful about it. When I first met you, which was not so much long uh, after that, you always describe yourself as an artist that's also a filmmaker, that's also a photographer, that's also a performance artist, that's also an editor, a collector, a communicator, organizing happenings. Was that always your vision or is that something that grew over time? I think it's, uh, I think things just grow naturally, you know, and I think you, um, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're a person who's, um, you know, interested in what's around you, you know, it's, you can take a thread and you can turn it into a rope and you can use that rope to pull yourself into completely different worlds of ideas and experience. And I've always seen that for me, that's, that's one of the, um, one of the, the purposes of art making is, is to enable one to do that, to create bridges where there are no bridges to, you know, to, to have a dialogue um, in, in with people that maybe there's, there's never a possibility to, to speak to otherwise. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's interesting because at this moment right now, we're all on electronic devices, but we're also, um, you know, we're, we're traversing the world. Julia is in Berlin and, you know, uh, someone else is in New York. And, and I think that, that it's, we, we can't forget that the reason we're here on this Saturday is to talk about art, to talk about culture. And, you know, and maybe those words, art and culture, are, are actually just pseudonyms for something else, which is really, we've found a community of people who, have something in common, something to share. We have a world vision or we have questions for each other. And that brings us together. And I think that's incredibly important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. If we go back to the slide we had, because in 94, you moved to New York and at age of 28, uh, 26, you had your first solo show at 303. And I remember 303 at the time 303 did so many legendary shows, and this was one of them, uh, which looks already pretty much like a Doug Aitken show. How was the show received, Doug? Well, I was, um, you know, when I, when I first moved to New York, it was so strange because I, I just, um, you know, this was a period where I, I think, um, you know, people I talked to would just say, oh, you, you just have to move there. It's, you, you know, that's kind of the next step. You'll, you'll learn so much by going there. And, um, you know, so I went there, but I was like incredibly unprepared. I mean, it was pathetic. You know, I kind of, I kind of showed up, you know, I, I knew one person in the city and I said, uh, I said, you know, do you think I could find a place to stay? And he said, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, sure. You can rent a little room in my studio. So I, I show up and it's this like um, rusted steel gate with a padlock on it. And, you know, he had sent me the combination of the padlock and I kind of walk into this dungeon-esque space with uh, no windows, no heating, no cooling. And it's not the first room, it's not the second room, it's like the last room that is just this, you know, like cubicle. And, and it was it was, it was was really, you know, I, I remember that idea for me at the time, you know, I, I was, I think maybe uh, 22 or something, 23 when I moved to New York. You know, it was so kind of strange and intimidating, but also it was, there was a stimuli, this kind of electricity, because I, I, I would start to find people that, uh, you know, that I really liked, that were making things, and we could just sit down and have, a, just have some faux on Baxter Street and talk about, talk about art making. And, um, you know, it was, I think it was a very, um, it was a very, like, uh, a very energetic time in New York City in the 90s. Uh, there was a lot of projects that were happening that were uh, um, happening off the grid, there were, you know, there's someone finds an open window to a, a, a warehouse and they just crack it open and someone installs a show for the night or something in the East Village or, you know, so, 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 so that, that, that became kind of, for me, it became really a sense of finding my community, uh, different artists that I 
I, I still am very close with and uh, it's very interesting. If we go to the next slide, we already talked about the moving, moving, traveling monsoon from 95. It established you also as a traveling eye, a traveling eye with, with a camera and want to talk a little bit about monsoon? Yeah, so monsoon, the slide that we're looking at is, um, this was a work that I filmed in um, uh, Guyana and I, I, I went back and revisited the uh, site of uh, the Jim Jones People's Temple um, mass suicide. And I wanted to go to the site. I think at that point it was about um, maybe 15 years later. Um, and I wanted to film whatever we found there. I wanted to kind of study with a, a very quiet eye how the landscape was being reclaimed by the natural environment. And um, I, it wasn't a documentary. It was more kind of trying to use the camera almost as a, a kind of a, uh, an alchemy, a way of kind of distilling something out of the landscape. Um, something was in transition, but it was a very early work. It was, it was, it was a quite minimal piece, but it, it, it kind of paved the way, I think, for um, really um, working with the idea of landscape, kind of psychological landscape. It was also for me an introduction into how you explore and how you discover and how you document. If we go to the next one, and we actually don't necessarily have to see, have to watch a lot, we can watch a couple of seconds, of Diamond Sea because your approach in the 90s, the 90s were also a moment where universalism and travel was at a, as a never heard of height and everybody had a camera, everybody had a camera and you had the skill set to create images that to my knowledge and also how you allowed the viewer to edit your own footage by moving left or right or through. If we watch a couple of seconds of Diamond C and then we should go to Electric Earth. The idea of entropy, the idea of data flow of electricity, the idea of architecture and houses decaying or being destroyed. Um, when, you, when you look at an early work like this, which is like 25 years old, you already see works that later, like for example, Mirage or whatever came up. So very early on, I think you had a certain, when I talk about house and architecture, acceleration, entropy, it was already in the work. And for me, the most groundbreaking experience was actually, let's watch a little bit longer of Electric Earth, because I think this really was a paradigm changer in the 90s. If we go to the video and just watch that for, for a while, because I think that really changed how we looked at, at art in the 90s. A lot of times I dance so fast that I become what's around me. It's like food for me. I like absorb that energy, absorb the information. It's like I eat it. That's the only now I get. That's the only now I get.
Oh, if we go one slide back to the still, it's easier to, yeah. Doug, where you, when you, you got the, the grand prize of the Venice Biennial in 99 for this, that was a very, very celebrated piece. When you conceived and realized Electric Earth, were you aware how groundbreaking this piece is? Uh, oh, no, I mean, I, 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 I think I was um, very interested when I was making it. I, I felt like we were living in a landscape that was accelerating and we were in this crossroads where we were both trying to keep up and at times synchronizing and flowing. And at other times we're, we're almost offset, left behind. And um, I, I really kind of wanted to explore that idea. So the work kind of came out of that. And um, uh, we made it um, in a very kind of intuitive, a very spontaneous way. I remember um, the filming was fast and the crew was small and we would just go out at night and just, you know, just shoot and shoot and shoot. And the piece kind of came together. And, when we look at the slide right here and we see the environment, it was, um, it was three rooms. So you kind of walk through these different rooms. And the idea with that was really, I wanted to take that idea of the cinematic narrative uh, where you, you know, sit in a chair and watch a screen. I wanted to explode it. I wanted to have something that the viewer could navigate on their own, that they could kind of author their own experience. They could discover. And I felt that maybe in doing so, that would be a way to bring the viewer closer to the artwork, inside the artwork. They would become the artwork as opposed to something that they um, simply see. This is a picture of when it was installed at MoCA in your big show, in your retrospective. But I remember how it was installed in a very, very long, extended, nearly narrative way in Venice, in the Venice Biennial 1999 in the Giardini. And that time I did this year, I didn't, that year I didn't go to the opening. I went in August or I went like nobody was in the biennial. <laughs> super hot August. I was the only person in the Giardini. And it was very fortunate because the sheer long stretched format and the three separate rooms being the only person I learned because I had watched cinema and movies in a linear fashion. You switch on the TV, you go to a movie, you watch from A to Z, movie over. But this was not linear. This was a broken narrative. I was my own editor. I could sit in the first room, go to the third room, go back to the first room, go to the second. So you made basically the viewer part of the editing process or the perception process and you really broke the narrative in a way that you enabled and empowered the viewer. It was a very, very different way because it wasn't that we could be zapping channels and we had cable TV and everybody had a camera. That was still pretty much the authority of cinema or TV channels that provide you with a linear version. How did you come to the spatial, how did you come to the spatial sequencing and fragmentation? I was very interested in the idea of architecture coming alive, architecture becoming fluid. This idea that architecture wasn't something rigid, but you could almost kind of, you could, you could allow it to become incredibly flexible through image and sound. And um, I remember with the Venice Biennale that year, I remember um, talking to uh, Harold Zeman about, um, about ideas. And, um, and we were talking, he said, he said you know, there's, there's uh, many works here that are, um, you know, out in the open. Um, and I, and I, I said, yeah, I said, you know, there's an area here, these are sculpture works, these are uh, you know, more um, paintings and things like that. And I said to him, well, what if, what if we seceded? What if, what if I just made something that seceded from, from the Biennale? And it was just its own world. And you, you know, you have a door and you walk in, but that's it. You know, after that, it, it, it kind of is its own um, environment completely. So I think that was, uh, you know, this was an early piece, but it was also, um, I felt like uh, maybe some things kind of came together in this. <laughs> yeah, and especially what we have seen in the two videos we saw, the early works, the idea of electricity, that data flow and energies, electric earth, like what a fantastic title at the time. 
and and still it was also the title of your retrospective uh, at MoCA. Let's go let's go a little further. So we have I'm a new. Go to the next. So you basically projected a whole block of of Manhattan here at the museum. You you totally uh, took that over in sleepwalkers. And if we go to the next, at the same time, you work on very minuscule kind of collages going back. And if we go to the next, to the next, you're also cataloging the world. This is nearly like your own encyclopedia. encyclopedia. What were you thinking behind the 99 cent stream dreams? Well, you know, it's funny because uh, the last few slides you showed, um, you know, they I probably seem totally uh, diverse, but they're to me like very interconnected. Um, you know, with um, Sleepwalkers, uh, which was a work that we did, which kind of um, covered the facades of, of MoMA and, and Klaus, you were, you were kind of the chief curator producer of it, actually. So. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time together making that and it was a, it was a, a real journey trying to figure out how to make this work. How do you, you know, create something that um, lives on the outside of the museum, not the inside, how to create something that um, has a narrative or a story and there's just enough that you can hang on to and follow, but it's not didactic. And I remember I, um, for a while I, I was, um, I, I booked a room in a hotel by Times Square because I just wanted to be around Times Square at nighttime. And, you know, not, Times Square is actually not far from uh, MoMA at all. And um, I, would, um, I would walk around there and I would look at how the lights, the LED lights, the advertisers and, you know, the billboards and everything and how violent they were. And I thought, you know, this is incredible. We're actually living in this world of signage. It doesn't matter if we're driving down the 405 in Los Angeles or, you know, um, passing through any city in the world, we're kind of, we kind of just accept it. We just say, it's okay that language is, is desperate and reaching out and trying to seduce us and trying to sell us something. Um, and uh, so I thought, I thought maybe the approach that we take to sleepwalkers is completely different. Instead of having images pushing out, we have projections that are soft spaces that you can fall into. Instead of having language that's, that's trying to capture you, we have scenes which have abstraction and ambiguity. And, you know, Sleepwalkers was really kind of a story of a city told through maybe six or seven different individuals. And it choreographed the building. It kind of allowed the building to become this kind of, I mean, Simone, you're on this call maybe still, but like, it was a, a choreography, you know, it was, it was my form of choreography. It was a way of um, creating these kind of identities and people. And, you know, one person would move to the right on one building, another person at the same time. So all of a sudden the, these cold, faceless structures in Midtown Manhattan would have a presence. They would have a vulnerability. And I was, I was very interested in that, that, I, that idea of, of kind of transformation. Yeah. But you, you describe being in a hotel in Times Square. Yeah, that was rough. Just, <laughs> just a year later, you're coming with a work uh, migration and let's let's go to the next because we have a little video of that which I think is such an incredible from the from Times Square to to a very rural landscape let's play a little bit of that I want to explore the modern landscape the landscape that we have created I want to see if it was possible to look at a sense of deeper history, a kind of ecological history, what was here before us.
let's perhaps stop the video here and keep this wonderful still. How did you get the bison into the motel? <laughs> <laughs> Very slowly. <laughs> yeah, it was um, with migration. We actually filmed this work um, across America. We um, filmed from the east to the west. And um, I was very interested in this idea because I felt that, you know, we could almost, it was kind of exorcism almost. Like we could bring out these different qualities if we were in motion. If our, our story was about kind of moving from hotel to hotel to hotel, this repetition within the landscape. And in each of these places, we would kind of reintroduce an animal or a creature that uh, had been there. Um, and they would do what they did, you know, that whether it's the, you know, the mountain lion destroying the hotel room or, um, you know, 12 Western jackrabbits, timid and afraid, just hiding in the shadows. Yeah, I know it's such an incredible piece. And I remember we had just co-curated a larger exhibition together, Hard Light, and then, uh, worked in a very, very urban setting. And the next thing was a complete surprise with you going into migration, bus migration of animals, which of course, as a metaphor, I felt was, was an incredible uh, continuation. When you think about monsoon or diamond sea, I think the landscape, nature, and, and tropic and, and, and movement in nature is also something that is very, very, much a current uh, a current in your work if we go to another urban work we recognize at roche hold on there he is in a multi multi channel and we go to the next we see where this work actually is it's on the river in in rome how did this come about doug well um this piece is titled frontier and um what we're seeing here is, uh, this is uh, um, Isla Tiberina um, in Rome. And um, we were, um, you know, we were talking about doing a project, a project um, in Italy. And um, <clears throat> I had this idea of kind of creating this outdoor forum, this kind of coliseum almost that, you know, had no roof, that had walls, um, but kind of a, a, a contemporary coliseum. And, you know, in it is this kind of narrative of a person who's kind of very much a voyeur, and their, their, their viewpoint on life is to kind of watch and not participate. And in this work, you see, um, you see a man walk into a film theater and he you know, watches, watches something, wa walks outside and kind of every scene that he passes um, is like a film. And eventually this world that he's in, um, it starts to become unglued, a, a riot ensues, um, it becomes violent. And he never really participates. And eventually you realize that the riot is another film set. The camera pulls back, you see the rioting, you see the protagonist, you see the entire kind of um, film structure, architecture. And um, I guess I'm just very interested in that, uh, that fine line between fiction and nonfiction. Yeah. If we go a bit, a bit further, so we go take the island, go to the next. You talked about the cinematic setting. Here we are in a theatrical setting. And perhaps we should play a couple of seconds of this. This is at Art Basel, a great exhibition that a group of curators, including Hans Ulrich Obrist and uh, Philippe Parino and, and others, together with artists, created an exhibition in time, not in a space where everything is simultaneous, but one after the other. So the space became a duration. So Art Basel in 2009. Let's have a, let's watch a bit and listen. <laughs>
handle comes up, the hammer comes down in front of all people from the art world, which I felt <laughs> was so genius. <laughs> so, say a bit where this form and repertoire and where the performance came that you brought from one area into the art world. Yeah, I, I, I had a, I kind of found this subculture of rural farm auctioneers uh, years ago. And um, I, I, I remember I flew out to Kansas City to the World Farm Auctioneer Championship one time. And, um, yeah, and I was just fascinated by this use of language. Like how fast can language go? How fast can information move before it just breaks down and abstracts? So, um, yeah, so I started working, you know, with men and women who are doing this and there are tobacco auctioneers, uh, tractor auctioneers, cattle auctioneers. And uh, my idea was to kind of work with them in a different way and kind of bring them into a structure of performance and to really see this as music, but to see it as kind of information music. So um, what we see here is uh, the, the, our, our contribution for the opera. And um, I, um, yeah, I thought about this idea that we have a theater, we have an opera space and you know, everyone goes to be seated, to be passive, and they go to watch the stage. But what happens if we kind of reverse that maybe? And, you know, maybe instead the uh, ushers that take you to your seat, the security guards are all kind of, they're actually our performers, they're kind of sleeper cells. And what if the stage just is black and it just gets brighter and brighter and brighter and it's kind of an ambush situation almost. So, so this was kind of a, 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 yeah, it was an interesting piece. And we've done other collaborations with them. It was an incredible moment for the art world because all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the cattle auction resonated with the art world and the art fair in Basel. It was quite a moment of revelation and, and pause and reflection. It was really a great work. If we go to the next complete, complete change of scenery. And I think your work has always been connected when I call entropic and landscape and nature. You have always been incredibly interested in environmental uh, tensions, environmental um, connections. This is in the in Inhotin in Belo Horizonte in Brazil, an incredible sculpture park of the highest caliber, there's an incredible work by Chris Burden. There's yeah. an incredible work Beam drop. Uh, like, excuse me? Beam drop. Beam drops, there are such incredible sculptures from, from there's a Janet Cardiff pavilion, your pavilion here. So in this combated landscape of the jungle that we all, the rainforest that we all try to preserve, we go one slide back, you created this pavilion, built a sonic pavilion, we go further, so we see that it's in the landscape, go one further, and then show the video because there's a beautiful introduction of how you actually hear and perceive the world. It's so incredible that you're digging a microphone 700 feet into the ground to hear the tectonic shifts of the, of the earth. What was your motivation for the sonic pavilion, Doug? 
Well, I was um, I was thinking about the idea that we're we're our lives are kind of in constant motion, and everything around us is um, is 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 like that. But we kind of assume that the one thing that's stable is what's below us, the earth, the earth under our feet as we stand here, and it's not. It's also as this living creature, this organism, this constantly changing, shifting. Um, um, entity, which is our planet. And I wanted to make a work that could tap into that, where almost like a kind of sonic geyser, the sound of the inner earth could come into this space, this pavilion. So you basically have an artwork which is constantly changing. It's in real time, it's live. I visited the pavilion. What is so interesting is when you are looking to the sides, you can look outside. But when you're looking straight out or you try, you're not seeing anything. What was the, what was the thinking and the concept behind that, Doug? Yeah, I really appreciate that you noticed that. Um, it was uh, constructed of curved glass with a kind of lenticular film and it acted like a lens. And I wanted that sense of, um, of, of a kind of a very specific perception when you're inside. So you're not simply in a shelter, but you're kind of in this psychological space, you know, you see something very clearly, but everything else around you kind of diffuses and, and, and falls away. Yeah, it reminded me also that it threw me back into, because I couldn't look straight out, I had to listen. So it forced me to basically switch the gear from, from visual to audio. And, and I think this is one of, and we later talk about the islands, but you digging deeper, you going into depth, like literally, it's kind of such an incredible uh, uh, through line of your work. Let's go to a more celebratory moment. Let's go, go two further and we go to the year 2011 and play this really wonderful celebration at MoCA. <laughs> we play, yeah. <laughs> But it's incredible how you go from detecting the tectonic, the tectonic acoustics of the moving of the tectonic plates to, to hear the whipping and the, the tables. The tables, was this, were the tables conceived around this time or for this performance? Um, well, <laughs> the tables, the tables I, I made some time before and I, what class is referring to is, um, uh, I, 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 I tell you the truth. I was at, at a <laughs> museum, museum <laughs> dinner one time and, um, in New York. And, uh, and I was sitting there, I was just thinking, this is so strange. You know, I, I'm just having this awkward social moment. The people uh, I'm sitting next to, I have nothing to say to them. And uh, they have probably have nothing to say to me. And I thought maybe I should try to invent a, a social space that doesn't rely on language. So, you know, if you have those awkward moments, you don't need to speak. You can just play. I can play a rhythm and you respond in a rhythm. So I, I, I started making these tables, these kind of wood chamber tables that you could perform. And uh, there's actually kind of two of them in front of me right now. I have them in my house. I think Cliff and Mandy have one. Um, so when we were talking about doing this, this Mocha Gala, um, you know, I thought, well, you know, I, I love Mocha. I mean, I grew up, you know, taking the bus to Mocha. Um, <laughs> you know, I saw some some of the, the the shows that really had a huge effect when I was very young there. So, I I just felt that you know we should really um, you know take this to 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 the limit and uh, really make something that's a a, a very um, 
a very beautiful and unexpected evening. So um, we created kind of a happening, kind of a performance. And um, we had a number of the tables at the, uh, at the gala were these handmade wood chambered tables. And, you know, after you'd eat some percussions would just kind of come up behind you and just start using them. And uh, gospel singers, uh, you know, different, different people, different mediums kind of created this, this really kind of montage-like performance. Uh, there's just one funny thing in that footage you just showed, I, I found myself laughing, that when we were editing that, uh, one of the last shots where uh, you see this, the singers and this whipper, the, the, the radius of the whip started going wider and wider. And, uh, you know, obviously, I think a lot of people thought, you know, this is getting a little bit, uh, you know, might get a little dangerous. Um, but when I was looking at the footage, <laughs> I realized there was one guy who just keeps standing there motionless while other people are receding. And we zoomed in on the footage. I looked at it was Werner Herzog. Oh, yeah, wow. <laughs> he was just kind of in this trance. He was like, you know, what is this? So <laughs> just, a, just a little footnote. <laughs> That's amazing. That's an amazing detail. I, I'm, I'm very happy you didn't hurt him. He's still, he's still making great work. So prolific. <laughs> <laughs> so if we go to the next, and actually we as a group during, the, during this visit, not, not to the next, we stay, go back one, because we want to go to Luma together when, no, to, to Luma, to the next piece, yeah, stay here. So we want to go to Luma together. It was meant to open this summer, so everything is delayed. But you did this incredible work, work here, Altered Earth. And um, Luma is also part of a whole um, environmental approach of saving the Camargue and the changing history of the Camargue. So this is going to be an incredible destination to hopefully when the borders open, when travel is more common, we'll all go. And now we go to the next, because in the very beginning, I said lots of your work is about this, it's about the movement and the movement that is uh, basically also defined by architecture early on you and I worked on an exhibition, I Am In You, where a prefab house is moved on a highway. The next work was then called Interiors, where, where you turn the house inside out or inside up. And you also worked very much on, when you talk about Times Square, um, very early on in the 90s, I remember you projected a set of eyes on the Vienna secession that must have been like 97, 98 or so. So very early on using the projector for outdoors for an urban, for an urban signal. And I think the most um, all encompassing and the most all surround, it's Dolby here, was the Hirschhorn. <laughs> You want to talk a little bit about this because this is called song one this one we selected and i think it is so important that you added not only the visual you also added the sound you added and perhaps once we see here the the still of the hirshon let's go to the next we prepared a little video and watch that for like at least 90 seconds
truly monumental project. Do you want to talk a bit about this, Doug? Sure. I was, I was, um, I, I was kind of losing myself in the film. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think with, um, with, with song one, there was, there was really two things. You know, one, one was, um, you know, I, I recall very distinctly you seeing the building and the unusual shape of it and the lack of windows. And, you know, it, it's, it's really a, a Gordon Bunshaft architect. Uh, it's very kind of a, a brutalist structure. And thinking about how to activate this kind of dormant space, a space that seems so um, monolithic, but also to me, uh, oppressive. Um, and how do you activate it so it could become a story that had empathy, that had uh, a connection that people could um, really kind of uh, own that experience and share. So I, um, when I was developing it, I started thinking about the idea of repetition. I started thinking about the idea that you can hear a piece of music over and over, but every time you hear it, it's actually different. You're, you're noticing different uh, aspects. You're thinking about different thoughts. You're kind of projecting something onto it. And you know, this is true of life. Um, you know, driving to work and back and passing the same place. Um, so I, I felt, you know, what would happen if we actually created an entire artwork based on one song, one three minute song. So we re-recorded it maybe 50, 60 times, different musicians across, across the spectrum. Um, and then kind of made this piece, it was really this kind of journey through a modern world, kind of moving from person to person, but only using this connective tissue of this, uh, of the song to kind of create the narrative. Um, it was very, um, it was a very surprising project because I think when the work was up, what often happens is uh, a show opens and a lot of people rush to it. And by the end of the show, uh, fewer and fewer visitors arrive. And this was actually the absolute opposite. Um, more people came later and we had to kind of continue to postpone the closing of it because people in the city would actually come up. They would picnic, they would double park their cars and watch it. And it was very, um, you know, very, I was very surprised. And I think that there was this sense that uh, the work had created this bridge and the, uh, the community, the city had started to kind of um, claim it and, and come back to it. So uh, yeah, very, yeah, very surprising. That's an, what an incredible piece. What an, you talked a lot about fluidity of architecture. I remember, describing this piece and the fluidity of architecture here is not only visual, it's also audio. So let's go from the very monumental to let's go for the next couple of slides to go. Here we have the sonic fountain, we go to the next. And station to station, which is such an incre incredible, yeah, how do I even call it station to station? So. <laughs> Uh, if we go one back, we see the train. And I imagine you and a lot of artists on the train and then the train goes cross country and we look, good, look at the next slide and we see that you made the train also a moving screen. This time it's, a, it's, it's like LED, it's like a screen, it's not projected, going through the landscape and I remember when you arrived and there was this huge festival and happening and everybody participated. Uh, talk a bit about station to station because I think your development over the years in creating these participatory events is also something that I think you are more and more uh, broadening in, in, in a way. And this even ended up in, in some way or short, I remember you had, at the Barbican, you had by kind of, it, it, it went alive again. It did. Um, yeah, is, is there a clip to play, I wonder? We didn't, we didn't oh, okay. it for, for station to station. Yeah, I think, I think with station to station, um, I remember you know, distinctly be before I had um, you know, made that project, I was, I was kind of, I was frustrated with how in culture, there's such segregation between mediums, between art or film or literature, music. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're almost separate islands. And I, I kept thinking to myself, like maybe I need to do something about this, try to do something about this and try to bring these things together, try to create a, a platform that could be in motion, continuously changing, where people could use this 
platform to create. They could actually use it as a nomadic studio. And we could invite people, you know, like Patty, for example, or Beck, or, uh, you know, different artists could make installations using it or performances. Like Liz Glynn did performances all across the country on it, or Lawrence Wiener made the flags. Ed Ruscha made cactus omelets in Winslow, Arizona. Uh, so it was, for me, it was really kind of a, almost a, 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 a kind of, in a quiet way, it's kind of a social activist project. I wanted to create something that would be like a broadcast tower for culture. And I wanted it to be the people who are creating things using it. I wanted to cut out the middle person. I wanted to cut out the managers, the agents, the venues, the record company, the the, all of those kinds of things and just have, have something where, you know, we could just have a conversation say, what would you love to do? Well, we have this project and I'd love for you to do it. Let's make it happen. Yeah, no, absolutely an incredible moving uh, happening through the, through the country. How many different stops did you have? Doug. I think there was about 12. And, um, you know, one of the things that I found, I mean, kind of going back to the idea of the museum and I think, you know, Another great conversation all of us, everyone on this Zoom call could have together is what is the future of the museum? You know, where does the museum go from here uh, as it moves into the 21st century? And I think with, um, with Stacia Stacia, I realized that actually like every single place we would stop, there was a building that was empty. It was a train station in this case. You know, you go through the Midwest and some of these train stations are like a tumbleweed rolling through and a guy sleeping in the corner. Or Chicago has a beautiful station. But all of these we were able to activate for, you know, a day, for example, and to transform them into these spaces that uh, were really, um, uh, really kind of amazing and um, uh, filled with energy and unpredictability. Yeah, no, what an incredible happening. So let's, let's go and change the moving into the static. Let's see here installation views from your still life show. Let's go to the next now and the exit the next you know just to uh, just to pause here really quick klaus you know it's it's uh I, it's great that you noticed these pieces and that they came after station and station because i think station was so um it was so all-encompassing you know it's four thousand miles 30 days it took probably two years to prepare the project um you know that after that i was um i was i was spent and I remember just saying, I just want to be in the studio alone. I want to make physical objects again. I want to make things I can touch with my hands so that I can, you know, that I can, I can alter and change. And I had this incredible inspiration to create things that were physical and human scale. And this body of work here is, is very much from that. Um, on the right side, we see Twilight. And just to talk about Mocha really quick, uh, you see Twilight is a, a, a sculpture of a phone. It's a cast public phone, uh, probably something that we'll never see again. But uh, I was in downtown LA, not far from Mocha one night. I was uh, late night. I was at a restaurant. You know, I had a few drinks and I walked outside uh, you know, one in the morning to uh, just to get some air. And, uh, and I remember no one was around. It was, it was just empty. And there was three phones next to me, three public phones. And one of them had the receiver missing. The next one had the facade so vandalized you could never use it. And the third one, the phone was stolen. And I remember <laughs> like, like looking at this, just looking at this thinking, you know, this is no longer a phone, it's a sculpture because it will never be used again. It's just absolutely obsolete. You know, so, so, so this is kind of a, a piece which, you know, allows light to move through it and light and darkness, it, it senses the viewer's presence. The viewer actually kind of performs the sculpture, how close or how far they are. So, so I think to talk about creativity, I think that sometimes creativity is kind of like a tree and you have these many branches. And you know, in this scenario, maybe station station was a very extreme branch in one direction, but by doing that, that allows you to traverse the other direction in a way which is something very different that's very um, singular perhaps in the situation. It's actually quite an incredible thing that nobody ever thought about taking all the phones down. So I, perhaps that's happening right now. A lot of sculptures out there. <laughs> I know. Let's go to the next slides. Modern Soul here in Monte Carlo in 2016. 
and to go to the next slide, like sky riding, and perhaps we go to the next. Underwater pavilions that was done in collaboration with MOCA and they were in front of the Catalina Island. What was your, what was your motivation and inspiration for the underwater pavilions? Well, I think that, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about landscape and, you know, I think that we have to kind of recognize that over 70% of the earth is underwater. Uh, you know, this huge, vast uh, terrain that we know so little about. And um, I, uh, it, with, with this work, I, I wanted to find a way to um, bring the viewer outside of uh, the way they're accustomed to viewing and to create a situation to provoke them to do something um, that would be maybe more experiential, that might be time-based. So the idea was to really to create these three sculptures that would be under the surface of the ocean uh, that you could go out to, that you could swim, that you could dive, that you could experience, but they're also living. They were constantly changing, teeming with sea life. Um, the, um, the facades of them were both mirrored and then the other side was a kind of a rough aggregate that allowed sea life to grow on it. And um, so in, in essence, really, I think I was very interested in creating a living artwork. Where are they now? Uh, these, this piece, this project we've taken down, but uh, we've actually, um, we, we just finished building a second set out of a different material in Italy. And um, we're um, planning on, uh, on installing those in the Caribbean uh, this coming winter. There's a very beautiful video footage of a seal <laughs> flooring the underwater pavilions and seemingly seeing the, the seal sees itself in the mirror. It's, it's really beautiful. Let's go for the next slide, please. And for the next. I put two slides in so it's clear that it's not a photo. We are looking at something three-dimensional. We are looking at a sculptural installation garden from 2017. What is garden about, Doug? Well, it's really a, it's kind of a immersive installation that um, I think to me, it really kind of talks about the, um, the dichotomy between the natural landscape, the true natural landscape and the landscape that we've created for ourselves. Um, Are you motivated by for you, we, taught, we, we looked at the sonic pavilion in the rainforest. We are looking at the underwater pavilion. I know you are also thinking about other ocean projects. <laughs> not, I'm not mentioning any. And here with the garden, is that something for you? Is the environment and ecology a concern for you? Or is this just coming with a territory that your traveling eye cannot avoid exploring it? Well, I, I think probably both, really. I mean, I think the, um, you know, I think the, the ecology of our environment is, is absolutely under siege. And, um, you know, this is something that, that we can work with. But yet, I don't think that uh, these works are necessarily overtly um, dealing with those, those topics. I think they're, they're, they're maybe a little bit more indirect. But you know, some of these projects like um, the underwater pavilions or another project, New Horizon, um, have been collaborations, not with museums so much, but with uh, uh, conservation groups. And that's been very interesting when you find yourself kind of stepping outside of the art sphere and you find other dialogues, um, you know, dialogues with um, everything from you know, uh, deep space and NASA to ocean conservation to, um, to you know, looking at looking at land trusts, um, and I think that's one of the things that for me that become continues to inspire me is that I see art having the capacity to broaden and broaden in uh, in, in that relationship. If we go to the next slide, because this this work Mirage actually brings so many of the aspects of your work from the traveling house, prefab house from I'm and you, yeah. to the house that you made as a work when you basically deconstructed your parents' house, to the building of your own house. Talk a bit about more about Mirage, which we here see in, in Palm Springs. 
Yeah, Mirage is a, Mirage was a work that I, I created, and I was very um, very interested in this idea of kind of dematerial. Like, could we create something in our work that would kind of appear and disappear? And I thought about it. I thought about what would the form be, and I was attracted to this idea of something that we do see every day, all the time. You know, this is kind of a a form of a house that is everywhere, everywhere in the world. Um, you know, a one story house with windows, a basic structure, and I think, you know, in the history of uh, land art, many works um, are often abstract. Uh, Walter de Maria's lightning fields or spiral jetty are these kind of beautiful abstract forms, grids or mathematic structures. And I wanted the opposite. I wanted something that was absolutely mundane, um, something that you'd seen so many times that you would not even perceive again. And I thought if I could insert something like that out of the world around us, I could distill it and I could transform it in this way where when you see it, you no longer see it, but you see yourself or you see its surroundings. And that was really kind of the starting point for it. And I think one of the things that I found as, as the work was there, it's been in uh, three different locations, is that the work kind of assumes the location it's in. If it's a full moon, the moon reflects off it. If it's the rising sun, it becomes a color gradient. So it's kind of constantly in flux and transforming. And it is kind of disappearing. Here yeah. we have it in Detroit. And if we go to the next slide, that is where, it, I think it's right now still, it's in Gstaad in Switzerland, right? Yes, yes. Will it stay there? Uh, we're trying to see if we can keep it there a little bit longer maybe, but uh, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> but here it's really disappearing, both as a mirror and under the snow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if we go to the next slide, modern figures you showed here in Los Angeles, and we go to the next. New era, and to the next slide, please. New era is about the invention and the science and the individuals, or the individual singular, behind the invention of the cell phone. Do you want to talk a bit about about this because this is such an incredible story also. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Um, New Era is a work which um, is, is kind of a, almost a, a portrait of this, this, this individual, this man who is now I think 87. And um, his name is Martin Cooper. And he is the, um, the inventor of the cell phone. He also is the person who made the first cell phone call ever. And um, I was thinking about the idea of technology and I was thinking about how we we find technology so daunting, it has no face, it just kind of exists and it, and it perseveres. And I, I felt, you know, is there a story behind this? Is there someone who has kind of created a fundamental um, invention that's changed the way we live? And that road kind of led me back to, uh, back to Martin. And, um, you know, it took a while, it took a long time actually for him to kind of open up and agree to do this. And um, when he did, we found ourselves in conversation for, you know, quite a while. We kind of filmed this, filmed this piece and then uh, the piece kind of expanded into this really kind of a, a, a portrait of, of a very um, vast and sprawling world that's kind of connected um, in, this, in this way through information, through pulses of electricity. And um, what we see here is the actual installation. The installation itself, I want to design a room that had uh, multiple angles. Um, every other wall is mirror, then projection, mirror, then projection. So you kind of walk into the space and you're divorced from, from reality. You kind of are in this infinite space. And um, I saw that as being kind of uh, metaphoric to um, the story, this kind of Plato's cave and this creation um, that's, that's omnipotent, that's just kind of um, uh, bled into our lives seamlessly. Little did he know how he changed our world when he did that first <laughs> cell phone call. Let's, <laughs> let's go to the, to the next, please. New Horizon. And we have another beautiful image of that. Where did you do that? And who commissioned this, Doug? Um, actually, like we were talking about before, this was commissioned by the trustees, which is a land conservation group in uh, Massachusetts. And um, the, um, the project was, you know, originally I think they were doing 
works with artists in different natural settings. And um, as we were talking about it, um, uh, the curator that I was working with, Pedro Alonso, said, well, you know, here's a number of different locations, you know, we could use one of them. And I kind of zoomed out on it. I thought, I thought, why would we use one? Maybe we could create a work that could actually use many locations. It could go from the uh, Atlantic Ocean all the way into the, the state, deep into the state of the Berkshires. Um, and, um, and how can you do this? <laughs> I, I didn't really have a solution at first, but um, I thought, well, if we could find a way to fly, that would work. And if we could fly using hot air, there would be no sound. So we could, in essence, we could have the gondola, we could build our own gondola so it could become a studio. And that studio, we could then uh, invite people you know, to be in the air and they could, you know, whether it's, it's someone reading a spoken word place piece or filming or improvisational music. But then also when we take off, we could um, stage happenings and the happenings I wanted with this project to really curate them. So they're very much about the idea of the future. So we could tap into, you know, someone from uh, MIT could be next to Sarah Morris, the painter next to Norman Foster, the architect. And you'd have these interesting friction um, yeah. so, so this was about a year ago. It was, yeah, a year, year and a half ago. <laughs> Let's go to Sonic Mountain. So if we go further, and perhaps to the next in Sonoma. Is this a permanent piece, Doug? Yes, it is. It's an it's a, a outdoor sculpture. Uh, it consists of um, 365 um, mirrored chimes, mirrored uh, uh, chimes that can blow in the wind and they're each one is finely tuned is hand tuned so it creates a composition that is um, it is within those no notational system but it's also changing continuously by the direction of the wind and um, it, it was one of those works for me that was very um, surprising when we finally finished it and I, I hiked up the hill you know and I listened to it because at times it was almost like this glowing aura of sound like this soft omnidirectional audio. At other moments, it would be um, percussive and you would hear these rhythms and patterns happening within it. And you know, to, to me, it really just kind of tapped into that idea of, you know, can we create art that's living? Can we create art that can change continuously, that can be evergreen on its own? That's an incredible piece. And it's between the balloon floating in the wind and the sonic pavilion that you did in InnoTeam and the, uh, the, uh, the islands, the submerged islands, your interest in architecture, in pavilions, and in basically not only a traveling eye, it's also a traveling microphone, like really listening to, to the sounds around you. I think it would be wonderful if you could lead us a bit through your house, because we see you there, not in your, ah. street, in your house, and we see a wallpaper that blends in with a window. Before we do this, I would love to show quickly your current exhibition. Oh, please. Which, which is, and perhaps we go there. And then if, in the, yeah, flex and debris, we go to the next slide, please. It's currently up. We go to the next. And we have two, Go to the next, please. We actually have a video clip so we can also watch a bit. We go to the next and to the next. Please do. Can you read that, Doug? Uh, <laughs> not offhand. <laughs> Please do not include me. It's such a, right. it's such an incredible piece. Thank you. So let's watch, let's watch a bit of the video, and then we can arrive in your house in the here and now. <laughs> <laughs>
Hey, thank you so much. Doug, is this a piece that for you is a piece that you, you, you could have only done after 2020 in 2021? Is that a piece of our time? Is this, is this also kind of documenting or visualizing where we are right now and when we are right now? I don't think I could have created it any other time. Um, you know, I, I, I'll tell you very quickly, but you know, it was this period of, you know, lockdown and I started to, you know, really challenge myself and say, you know, I'm talking, you know, March, April, May, June, um, how can you create during this? How can you not be beat down by the situation, but instead empower and, and create? And I thought about, um, Art de Povera. Um, you know, I thought about that. I thought about Art de Povera and I thought about kind of that idea of using what's immediately surrounding you. I thought, well, if I'm, you know, in this house, I can go in my closet. I can find some old shirts or fabrics somewhere in here and I can use them and collage them and cut them together. So I started doing this and I started using language, phrases, phrases that talked about the present or the future, data mining. Um, you know, digital detox, uh, everywhere, nowhere, these kind of, um, you know, kind of ideas that seem to crystallize something about where we are and where we're going. And gradually putting these together, sewing them into these flags, banners, blankets, um, that project kind of grew. And at a certain point, kind of um, late summer, I started thinking to myself, I would actually go in the studio and I would Kind of wrap myself in these sometimes <laughs> you know and, and I, thought, I thought it'd be interesting to really find bodies that could occupy these 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 sewn fabric pieces and um, I, uh, I thought I'd, I'll work with dancers and I'll create a language of choreographies um, I called Los Angeles Dance Project and uh, we made a collaboration and you know it was really um it was really unexpected you know we were we would be in downtown LA in a parking lot under the hot sun for hours every day for 12 days, just trying to dance, trying moves, um, you know, and then we filmed it and the filming was no easier. The filming was ridiculous. You know, all of a sudden the city was in front of us that had no people in it. You know, there was no police, no security guards, you know, so I saw it as kind of like this blank concrete canvas. And I saw it in a way where I thought to myself, you could actually, you could film anywhere, anytime now, and you could use the city and expand it in a way that you could never normally do. Um, so we had a very tight, small crew of friends that helped, and we would go out to these places, Los Angeles Riverbed, underneath the overpass for a freeway, and we would create these improvisational moments. We would perform and film and do it again somewhere else. That created the installation, and uh, I think the, the, the work itself, you never see faces, you don't see identity, you see physical form. And I wanted something that was a, a bit more um, open, that was really kind of about the modern condition, about, and also about neglect, about the, uh, the people that we don't see or try not to see, the conditions of, you know, whether that's desperation or homelessness, um, you know, and how to kind of use that in a way, in an artwork to really um, create something that was uh, uh, very, um, questioning and very immersive. What an incredible body of work. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Would you, would you allow us a little peek into your house and show us a little bit with your <laughs> camera? Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, I- I'm I putting you on the spot? <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's okay. I, I, I'll, uh, I gotta pick up this thing and uh, it might be shaky. So, so, you know, this is, there, we're downstairs at my house right now. It's in Venice and, um, uh, what we have here is, uh, let me see here, is uh, the walls in the house are, um, the walls are uh, hand silt screened. Uh, I took photographs of the vegetation outside and then I, um, I silt screened the inside so they would match. So you have these kind of moments where um, this um, kind of very green landscape outside, um, yeah. it kind of comes into the space. Um, outside the, the, the landscape, actually, I, I, I only wanted one color. I, mean, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I only wanted like green plants. Um, <laughs> no color. So my idea for that was just to have this space of tranquility, the space you could go with like less visual clutter. Um, the house itself um, actually has a, 
underneath the um, the floorboards of the house where the foundation is, um, I uh, inserted geological microphones into the uh, the foundation of the house. So you could um, you could go into this cabinet and you could turn on this mixing board and you see um, channel eight is house, channel uh, one through six is the stairs. And um, that would allow you to um, turn on the house. You could hear what sounds are happening in the earth underneath the house. Or for example, the staircase here, um, each of these steps is has a microphone inside it. And that will um, allow you to play the stairs. Um, you could play it with your feet or with a mallet or something. Sometimes I have friends that come over that make music that just wanna um, you know, have some dinner and perform. Um, this is another table here. Um, which uh, which uh, can be can be used. Uh, so anyway, so that's a that's a, a little bit of where we are right now. Um, you want to show us the stairs because I would you yeah, mind? Sure. Would you mind? Yeah. So um, I guess here's how it goes. Maybe we can go like this. So basically the stairs, um, the stairs are angled mirror and they go to a skylight at the top. And um, this allows the sun to pour through the house. So you don't really need electricity in the daytime. Um, it's really kind of a system of mirrors that um, allows the house to, to be illuminated. That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing this, Doug. <laughs> thank you, thank it's you, a pleasure. Thank you for such an incredible visit.